Awesome. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're really excited to be in a virtual community with you today as part of Seattle Design Festival. And it's so exciting to see that now that we've moved virtual, we even have people joining us all the way from Peru. So welcome. Before we get started, today we will have two sections to our participatory session. We'll start out by sharing some inspiration that we've learned through our work, as well as experiences in terms of strategies that have been helpful in being inclusive. And then the second half, we'll really, really learn from the wisdom and experiences of the crowd. So for the first half, if you have any questions, I love questions, um, to make sure we have enough time for the participatory sections in the second part of today's session, please type any questions you have into the Zoom chat, and my amazing colleague Jasmine will be moderating those questions. We'll be answering all of the questions at the very end after the participatory session to make sure everyone has the chance to collaborate and participate. All right, so my name is Felix Chang. I go by he, him pronouns, and I'm an associate strategy director at Artifact. We're a strategy design firm based in Seattle. I'm also a community involvement commissioner with the city of Seattle, working to advance equitable community engagement with city departments and officials. At Artifact, we are a digital service and product design organization, and we approach all of our work through the lens of responsible design, which means that in addition to designing for communities of youth as well as people, we think really intentionally about their context and environment as well. Over the past few years, I've gotten to work on some projects that I really loved, um, including the one shown here. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see part of our collaboration with Splash International, which is an international nonprofit focused on water sanitation and hygiene. Most recently, I was able to partner with Splash to think about how we can plan a summit, which would involve both local students, school officials, and international menstrual health experts to plan strategies for educational programs in Ethiopia, as well as India. We also were able to partner with the Gates Foundation to create Topeka, which is a platform that helps students from all backgrounds advance their critical writing and self-advocacy skills. And then another project was eSight, where we were able to work with the team to create a new hardware and user experience software system to help people with low vision navigate their environments and social contacts more fluidly. This year's theme for Seattle Design Festival is about time. And I think it's a great moment to reflect on how our practice of design has evolved over the years. Let's look at this through the lens of personal computing. If we think about computing in the 80s, we were really, as designers, focused on usability. How do we take immense server farms and put them into a personal computer that people actually can use? As computing advanced to the 90s and 2000s, designers started focusing more on desirability. The iMac was really marketed as something that was cool, that you really wanted. As smartphones exploded in the 2000s and 2010s, design became less about just situated locations. We didn't have to be seated at a desktop to use a computer. Design was really continuous and all around us. And you saw organizations really make great efforts in relation to physical accessibility. Technology organizations ranging from Google and Apple and Microsoft to startups really thought about how people with different abilities could better engage and interact. As technology and computing continues to advance in our current decade, this computing is becoming much more distributed to where there are sensors in all of the buildings and cars and environments around us. How does design change as a result? What does design look like in 2020? This year has been really challenging for all of us. Between the disparate impacts of COVID-19 on health and employment, as well as racial injustices that many of us are growing more aware of, I think many of us are in society are much more aware, as well as in design practice, that exclusion occurs not just at single situations or points in time, but as really systemic events. As a researcher and strategist, this year has really pushed me to think about situations when I potentially wasn't thinking about the system or potentially wasn't thinking about how my actions could be exclusive and how I could correct those mistakes. Antoinette Carroll, who is the founder of Creative Reaction Lab, shares with us that systems such as discrimination, racism, sexism, even poverty, were designed by people who made intentional decisions around exclusion. If these different forms of oppression are formed by design, they can be redesigned. 
I thought that this quote was really inspirational and pointed us to the fact that as we continue to progress as design, the efforts that we've built on in relation to accessibility and physical spaces is really important and people are doing great work and continuing to make progress. As we move forward in 2020 though, we need to think about inclusion even more broadly to encounter and think about all of these different factors that Antoinette described. Traditionally, as we all know, empathy is the bedrock of design, sense, design thinking and human-centered design processes. And I like to think of it as seeing through binoculars. It's a little bit voyeuristic in that you're looking at things that are in the distance. You can potentially observe what people's behaviors are like, but you don't really have much context. You can't see anything that's outside of your field of view in that given moment. You don't know what someone or something was experiencing before or after the moment you're observing them. And as you take empathy and view through a binocular and try to design with them, you need to introduce your own bias to extrapolate, oh, earlier this person might have been doing this. On top of that, empathy has its limits. As a cisgender Asian American man, it is really hard for me to really have full empathy for, let's say, a Black African American woman who is experiencing pregnancy and childbirth. I can have conversations, I can observe, I can really learn from their wisdom, but at the fundamental level, it is really just impossible for me to know what it feels like to navigate the health system as an African American woman, for instance and experience the compounding effects of structural racism and microaggression across time. If there are elements to empathy, how might we shift our approach? I think it's important to think about our approach more in relation to inclusion, which I liken to communicating via satellite. Instead of having a one directional voyeuristic relationship, when people, when systems of satellites function, the communication and exchange of information is bi-directional you're triangulating for multiple data sources. And if any part of the network is offline, it weakens the strength of the entire network. Across our experiences working with different partnerships with a range of organizations, as well as subject matter experts in inclusion uh, interviews that we've recently conducted, today we're sharing with you three fronts and levels along which anyone can take action to advance inclusion. The first is at the individual level. What are the practices and methods and decisions that you can embrace? The team and group level, what are the mindsets and perspectives that we must draw in? And at a cultural and holistic level throughout organizations and society, what are the conditions necessary to foster inclusion? The first half of this presentation will share inspiration that we've gained from learning from others as well as amazing work that other folks have done. And then in the second half of this presentation, we are really excited to make it participatory and have um, breakout sessions where everyone shares what has worked for you and develops new ideas for what we can do moving forward. Let's start out broadly and discuss and think about culture at a broad level. In relation to culture, you might have been in organizations or structures where you hear people say things like, oh, you know, I really want to be inclusive, but there's just so much exclusion going on. Where do we even begin? You might encounter leaders who say, yes, inclusion is important, but it's not our top priority and it's not in budget, or we really care about it, but it slows things down and we need to deliver by a certain deadline. How do you overcome these barriers? One is to start out by really approaching it from a top-down perspective and strengthen your processes and teams at a high level. A great place to start is for everyone at your organization, whether you're an individual practitioner or a leader, to always be questioning, what is the composition of my team and my organization? What backgrounds do they come from? What abilities and language and cultural backgrounds do they represent? Asking these questions is the first step to ensuring greater diversity and inclusion. It's also in the way that we as designers feel it's important for design and research to start at the beginning of the process we should also focus on inclusion at the start, when we are planning initiatives and when we are first conducting engagements. By starting, by starting and leading with that inclusion point of view, you're able to benefit from amplified and compounding effects as you continue to work. It's also really important to think about how we make inclusion is something that is built into our everyday work rather than something that's a tack on. Think about how you can find tools or workflows that orient themselves around inclusion. For instance, for visual designers, 
always using color checkers like shown here with Swift app that automatically suggest better um, visuals and visual color combinations with better accessibility. You might also imagine how these different processes might work for um, checking for bandwidth in the technologies that you create or checking for ableist language throughout anything that you create or content you put into the world. It's also really important to promote accountability. Social science, as well as behavioral economics research, suggests to us that when we establish explicit goals, make commitments, and create detailed plans, people are much more likely to follow through with action. In practice, this starts by asking at your organization and your team, what does inclusion mean for us right now? There are many facets of inclusion, obviously, including physical accessibility, racial and ethnic competence, um, language. These are all very important. By really establishing upfront which facet you are tackling in the moment really helps to align your team and gain focus, making it easier to plan a path forward. It's also really important to promote transparency as a means to then achieve accountability. This is both internally within organizations, tracking your progress against your goals for inclusion that you explicitly stated, as well as externally. AIGA, Google, and Antoinette Carroll have launched a design census where people are able to share their demographic, uh, educational, as well as vocational um, information. So that way you're able to have a snapshot of the industry. Efforts like these really exert public pressure on both the industry as well as organizations to be transparent and then also to make progress towards diversity. It's also really important to normalize inclusion at a system level. In general, people and organizations don't like to stand out. And so when you're able to make inclusion seem like the norm, it advances the entire practice. Looking at innovation field as, as inspiration, Artifact was fortunate to partner with Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development a couple of years ago to create the city innovations map, where we're able to have any city team in the world share their innovation case studies. They said what they did, the methods they used, as well as their learning. By having this map, we not only build a movement and momentum by inspiring people and saying, hey, if these folks are doing this innovation work, I can too, we're also strengthening everyone's collective capacity by learning from their mistakes, so that way we don't need to repeat them. It's also helpful to think about ways that we can build in norms at a system level. From a software perspective, organizations like Google Material Design, as well as Microsoft's Fluent Design System, have really thought intentionally about accessibility from the start. And the benefit of having a system that considers accessibility is that anyone or team that then uses that system automatically up levels their accessibility. You might also imagine how this can be parallel to efforts on a policy level at an urban or city or government level where you have regulations really up leveling the standards for accessibility. Now that we've thought about the conditions at a broad level within society and organizations that are necessary to foster inclusion, let's zoom in one level into mindset. What do teams need to have in terms of perspectives and approaches that help to shape inclusion through their work. I wanted to have everyone do a quick reflection here. If everyone could take 60 seconds, um, either open up a text pad on your computer or um, grab a sheet of paper near you and write down as many situations as you can recall in 60 seconds when you have been excluded. I'll go ahead and start a timer now. So go ahead and write as many situations as you can recall when you have been excluded. Timer starts now. Fifteen more seconds. Excellent. 
And that's time. Thanks everyone for participating in that reflection. Now, we're actually gonna do a second reflection now with a new prompt, same format, 60 seconds. This time, think about all the times, as many as you can, when you have excluded others. So once again, list as many situations as you can recall when you have excluded others, and I'll set a timer starting now. Fifteen more seconds. And that's time. If you were like me, it was much easier for me to think about all the situations when everyone has excluded me than to think about situations when I excluded others. I came up with more situations when I was excluded. I think our exercise shows that with, as creators, as designers, and as professionals, we all have control over situations when exclusion occurs, because it happens. I think this is the first step to acknowledging that this is an action we personally must take in relation to providing and creating more inclusive atmospheres and environments. In relation to thinking about perspectives of inclusion at a team level, Sometimes you might encounter situations where people aren't aware that exclusion is occurring. They might also be overwhelmed with the amount of exclusion that's taking place, or say that, oh, you know, I'm sorry that we were being exclusive, but we didn't mean to be exclusive. How do you overcome these barriers? The first step within an inclusive design process for any team is to really reflect on the exclusion that is taking place. In interviewing Bryce Johnson, who's inclusive design lead at Microsoft Devices, he shared with us, when you don't intentionally include, you will unintentionally exclude. Given that there's so much different types of potential exclusion that can take place, where do we even begin? Three, here are three lenses that can hopefully help. One is through the policy lens. Up until 1968, according to, to a Supreme Court ruling, it was legal for cities and governments to redline certain areas. That means they can mark and denote certain neighborhoods in a city as good neighborhoods, quote unquote, or bad or red neighborhoods based on the race of residents who live there. As you can see in this map of Seattle from the past, neighborhoods with more community members who were identified with the black, indigenous, people of color, and immigrant communities were often marked as the bad or red neighborhoods. And this, they, these residents were also prevented from renting or purchasing homes in other areas of Seattle. They also were less likely to receive mortgage loans from banks to buy their own homes, compounding income inequality. Here's a situation where regulation and policy led to measurable exclusion. From a built and physical environment standpoint, experts such as Cat Home, as well as the World Health Organization, indicate exclusion occurs when there are mismatches between a person's abilities and the environment around them. An example here we could see, for someone with different mobilities or perhaps a leg injury, this environment with the staircase is mismatched to their abilities to navigate it and access the building. A third lens for exclusion that we can view through is the felt or psychological environment. A great example and case study for this is online harassment of platforms. According to peer research, 40% of us have experienced personally online harassment, and these numbers increase greatly for members of the Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, as well as the LGBTQ plus communities. How do we try to prevent these exclusions from taking place? Fortunately, different organizations have started creating tools that allow people to reflect on exclusion at the beginning of work processes. From a policy perspective, the City of Seattle has created a racial equity toolkit which any city official um, or even member of the public can use. City departments use this as part of their budget planning process where they are asked to investigate 
any racial and demographic um, factors, as well as intended and unintended consequences of any initiative that they create and look for signs of racism or potential for institutional or structural racism that they can then weed out. From a physical environment and built accessibility perspective, Microsoft has created an amazing inclusive design toolkit that allows people to think through a variety of situations. And I really like that it helps and encourages people think about ability, not just as moments in time, but as ability as something that can range and vary across time. As we see here for the different senses, like with touch, different abilities might vary based on whether you have an injury or not. In relation to the psychological lens, Artifact was fortunate to partner with Omidyar Network, who's a leader in encouraging organizations to create ethical technology. In partnership with them, we created the Ethical Explorer Pack, which provides any product leader or team with a series of provocations and prompts of for reflection in relation to bias, access, accessibility, that they can then consider and reflect on as they create their product. Another shift that's important to make for inclusion in relation to mindset is to think about how we can shift power to diverse communities. Traditionally in design, there is a tendency to design for communities. To be inclusive though, we should think about all the ways that we can design with communities. How can we engage them through participatory and co-design methods as much as possible? How can we empower intended communities of youth to not only validate product decisions and give feedback, but to actually make those product and service decisions. What does it look like if we don't launch a product unless the community of youth says that this is awesome and this is helpful for us? You can imagine as we engage people more and more, it's important to do this not just at the beginning or at the end of the design or product development process. It's important to engage people in communities continuously. And as part of that, it's important to pay people for sharing their time and expertise. Anyone we engage through our work is a living expert in their knowledge, in their situation, and in their environment. And we should be compensating all people for their subject matter expertise. Once a product or service is released into the world, it's important to think about how we can facilitate community control and agency. I think a great example of this is Xbox's adaptive controller. As you can see at the top, the normal and traditional interface for it is pretty simple. But what's really amazing about this is the top row includes a variety of ports, um, a very large collection of them. So that way, depending on your personal abilities, you're able to customize this device in any way that you want to with a series of joysticks, buttons, and controls to make it work for you. Another example of control with a system is Apple's voiceover system that allows people's different abilities to scan the screen. And then through AI narration, it allows them to know what's going on. They can also interact with the system through braille output. You've also seen just different digital video platforms, I think do a great job of allowing people to modify playback speeds, which allow people to consume content in ways that work for them. All right. Now that we know the mindsets we need to hold from a team perspective, what are the practices that we as individuals can take and the decisions we should be making to advance inclusion? As designers or practitioners, we might be confronted with the challenge of what difference can I make as one person? Or you might be wondering, you know, I don't want to be inclusive. What if I do or say the wrong thing? Or you might be asking, you know, aren't we already designing for the majority? In relation to inclusion, it's really important to know that each of us can do our part in fostering belonging. As my former colleague Cheryl Kababa always said, it's really important to acknowledge that systems and environments are not neutral. Whether you're creating moderation guidelines for an online platform or you're facilitating an in-person workshop, it's important to acknowledge that it's, you must set ground rules um, because even if you don't set ground rules, there is implicit ones that arise from just who's there as well as the environment. Acknowledging that systems are not neutral are the first step to then creating more inclusive conditions. It's also really important to try to treat people as individuals rather than categories. Let's look at this through the lens of data. If you are trying to share information with someone, 
it's important as much as possible to share information that's personally relevant to them rather than say, oh, this information applies to Asian people. That makes it much more relevant and fosters belonging. From a data collection standpoint, try to never collect data unless it will directly benefit the community of use. A lot of times data collection efforts can be stigmatizing and forcing people to categorize themselves with different ways to identify. It's also really important to focus on and carefully consider representation. And I think an amazing example of this is Google's assistant uh, voice. If you think about traditional voice assistants for digital, um, digital platforms, a lot of times they're named female names like Alexa or labeled things like British female. What's really awesome about Google's system is instead of traditional labels, they label the voice assistants by color, such as pink and blue. And each of these different colors connotes a mood. But by doing this, they really break from the traditional stereotypes that, quote unquote, you know, women are subservient or women are there to assist men. It breaks down those traditional gender stereotypes. It's also really important to think intentionally about the defaults in terms of the imagery that you show on your interface, whether it is iconography, photography, or your brand visual language. Think about ways that your system and reflect on to what extent your system is reflecting the community around you. And as you show people with diversity, it's really important to not tokenize or marginalize the way you portray them. It's also really helpful to think about standards from a system level as well. I was lucky to speak with Jenny Lam, who's Senior Vice President for Brand User Experience at Oracle. And she explained to us that in digital design, a lot of times what's held up on a pedestal is often really European. It emphasizes Bauhaus design, clean lines, as well as sparseness. As Oracle embarked on creating their new Redwood design system, they really emphasized that they wanted to reflect their customers everywhere. They literally have customers in every country in the world. And so this led their team to really look at inspiration in art and culture from around the world, not just in the Western world. And as you can see here, that really reflected in shades that were warmer with more vibrant colors throughout their platform and design system. As we as a design community think about ways that we can be more inclusive, I think one of the things that I've taken away is it's important to focus not just on our intentions, but on our actions and as well as the impact of our actions. I hope that today everyone here has sparked some inspiration around actions that you can take at an organization and culture level, at a team or mindset level, as well as an individual and practice level as well. And so now I'm really excited to engage with everyone on our virtual community today to really build our collective capacity by having collaborative breakout sessions in just a moment. Well, let's go ahead and explain what these will look like. In just a moment, we will be dividing you into Zoom breakout groups of four to five. This works much better if you are logged in through your computer, so we encourage you to do that. As you are randomly divided into these groups of four to five, as a team, go ahead and select one area of focus for the next 10 to 15 minutes that you would like to brainstorm around. Would you like to focus on culture at an organization or societal level, mindsets at a team or group level, or practice at an individual level? Once you've selected a focus, go ahead and we'll ask you to share and document your ideas on a Google spreadsheet. So that way our collective community today can benefit from everyone's ideas. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us again. Um, I personally had a great discussion with a great team of folks. So really excited to see everyone here. I think what we'll do really quickly, if you have any questions, we have just five minutes left. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So feel free to enter your questions in the chat, um, but otherwise I would love to go through and just highlight some of the ideas that people have collectively generated. I actually learned a lot just from my really short discussion. Um, so really excited to see what other teams came up with too. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share real quick. Um, if you are still in the spreadsheet, feel free to highlight one idea that you liked the most that you would like um, to share out with the rest of the groups. I think from our team, I, we called it Team Tri-Sports because we started with three people. Um, one of the ideas that one of our team members brought up was that it's helpful in getting teams to and organizations to embrace inclusion, to really frame it in terms of the value proposition that it brings to the organization and to the business. And I think we brought up great examples of both what are the potentially negative value propositions of 
if we don't address inclusion, this could actually lead to risks such as lawsuits or the risk that people are just unable to use our platform, which then decreases our market share. Um, and then also that there's also the benefit of value proposition to where by you know, highlighting that you are inclusive, that builds your brand awareness, um, like organizations like Apple have done around accessibility. Um, Team Elephant has an idea they've highlighted. Um, they say that it's important to know that inclusion is everyone's responsibility not just based on specific identities. And I really, I think that resonates with me. Um, I think to, to your point, I think when only one person is focused on doing the work, it ultimately like inclusion cannot occur um, unless everyone is actively contributing. So I think that's a great, great point. Um, team Brain Frame and Mind Frame says that reverse who is less and who more, who to include. I think that really speaks to the fact that we as a community can think really intentionally about the ways that we continue to engage more with our communities. Um, and that's something that I've been trying really hard to think about in my practice as well. Um, so I 100% agree with that. And then Team Jade has acknowledged unconscious bias and learned personal perspectives. We are thinking the society's thoughts. I really like that. Um, and I think starting out and thinking about unconscious bias is a great point. Um, I think that's awesome. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and go to culture ones. I think we have some highlighted ones here. Um, so Team Blue Coyotes had coming up with community agreements as a group, checking in on them regularly to see how we are doing on those agreements. I think that's actually a great recommendation as well. Um, I think whenever I have been in communities where they, there were not those community agreements up front, often it led to chaos. So I think that this is definitely a great point. Um, team Barrett has quality insurance for inclusion. Utilize tools to check yourself throughout the process to review alignment. I like that a lot. Thinking about ways it's just built into your everyday work and thinking about functionality and font. And I think that makes it easier um, and also establishes consistency across all of your systems as well um, to where all the teams are using the same thing um, and that raises everyone's standards. Uh, another idea from team don't know is using same language agreed upon and avoid jargon and acronyms. I think that's a great point um, to me personally when I'm looking at acronyms, I often don't know what they mean and that definitely leads to exclusion. So I think that's a fantastic point. And then let's go just for time, we'll do a final one. Uh, team, different teams has different agents defining the value set of an organization bringing in their values. I really like how that ultimately gets to the point at where we need to be inclusive in defining values. Um, and also potentially that values might really be not just like unified, like one thing, but really reflects multiple perspectives. That's really interesting. Awesome. So I know we're at just about time. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Let me just check if we have any hot pressing questions. Cool, we're good. Um, thanks so much. I think I would really love for everyone in the spirit of practicing accountability to end with this Mad Lib. So feel free to take a screenshot of this or just write down this phrase um, on a sheet of paper or a text pad near you. Um, think about one action that you will take towards inclusion in the next month and just fill out the snap list. What is something that you will do in partnership with a specific community or group in a particular context? And what does that inclusive action ideally lead to? What's the ideal outcome? I encourage you, everyone, to fill this out. Um, put it somewhere where it's visible at your desk or on your computer and really use it as a way to check, and check in on yourself and see if you are taking that action towards inclusion. I'd also really love to continue the conversation. I think um, everyone I've met with so far and all the ideas you have are amazing. Uh, if you'd love to continue the conversation on inclusion, my contact information is in the upper right-hand corner. And um, as well, in relation to these inclusion commitments, also feel free to post them on social media as a way to increase external visible transparency and accountability as well. So once again, thank you everyone so much for joining. We'll just end with this. Um, once, you've written your once you've written your commitment, um, feel free to then drop off, but I'll also be here for anyone who wants to chat for a little bit as well. But um, thank you so much for joining us in community today. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.